Good morning. I violated coach guy rule number one. Start on time and finish early. I apologize. And I know that I violated coach guy rule number one last week because I went a little long. Sorry, Randy. I'll do my best this week. Okay? Anyway, uh, we talk all the time about friends. What? I'm sorry. Sorry. Usually people can hear me. How's that, Jim? Okay. Turn me down just a little bit. Anyway, uh, we talk a lot about friends, family. Uh, I had a few messages that I've shared with you before. I've talked about coworkers and told you stories, uh, a few stories about my life. Years and years and years ago, um, I am blessed to have some very, very dear friends uh, with me today from Wapak. Don't talk to them. Don't listen to a thing they say. <laughs> because remember, we all have interpretations of stories. And, and, and real quick, you know, I got to always tell stories. Years and years and years and years ago, I think first or second year, not in a third year that I was at Walmart, 1988, 89, 90. Was late getting back to my class from lunch. Seventh grade, Ohio history. How many of you have kids or grandkids in seventh grade? Oh, I love seventh graders. Drive me crazy, but I love them. Anyway, they were loud. One of the other teachers had to come over and settle them before I got to class. Well, back in those days, I was a little more energetic, got a little more excited, and I always wore cowboy boots. And I walked into class, and we had one of those old trash cans, metal ones. Boom! I kicked that trash can. I can't believe you guys were loud. I can't believe you did this. 20 years later, it turned into, I kicked that trash can across the room, knocked out three or four kids. And so... Whatever they tell you, take with a grain of salt. Anyway, here we go. Uh, had a wonderful, wonderful time on Friday. We went down to Laca Media, watched Irving Berlin's Holiday Inn. Oh my gosh. I, I don't know about uh, the rest of, of our folks that went, but I surely felt like the performers stepped it up. The, the performance I thought was at a new level than what we have experienced before. 
it was tremendous. They're going to be uh, doing Holiday Inn probably through the Christmas season. If you have a chance to go to Locker Media, I highly recommend it. It was wonderful. Um, flowers on the altar, where'd they go? There they are, are in honor of Russ and Martha's 45th wedding anniversary. I bet there was a time that you wondered, no, 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 no. I bet you there was a time you wondered if you were ever going to be 45 years old, huh, Russ? <laughs> and now 45 years later, still with the love of your life, two great kids, great grandkids. Congratulations, you guys. Congratulations. Um, a few other things. We had it scrolling earlier. Remember, uh, we have coffee with uh, Jim on Thursday out at Tim Hortons. If you want to come out, chat with Jim, chat with each other. Just a time, and, and I'll touch about this a little bit more in my message, but just a time to come together. Okay? Coffee at Tim Hortons Thursday morning. Orders for poinsettias. Is it poinsettias or poinsettias? Either one's okay? Okay. Orders for poinsettias are due December 1st. Please place your order of money in the offering plate. Um, our food drive. Food drive for November is anything. Canned goods, crackers, any, any kind of food items for fish we want to bring in for our food drive through November. Fall Wednesday night is this Wednesday at 6 p.m. There's a sign up back in the narthex to come in and, and worship and have dinner. We have sign up sheets for Advent Wednesday nights as well. And we need some ushers for December. So if anyone is willing to serve as ushers for November, or excuse me, December, please sign up in the back. And lastly, November 24th, and I mentioned this last week, immediately following worship, we're going to have a, a carry-in, quick meal downstairs, and then come up and decorate the church for the Advent season. Everyone is welcome. We welcome all the hands, whether you're nimble enough to climb a 15-foot ladder <laughs> or you're like me and want to sit there and do palm or the, the branches for the uh, Christmas tree and fluff them up. Anyone, everyone is welcome and we look forward to it. That's again next Sunday after worship. Let's continue with our worship. Peace be with you. And also with you. Peace be in our midst. Peace be in our very souls. Peace be the light of our paths. Peace be the way of our world. Peace be with you. And also with you. Our opening video is Love Changes Everything. Can you imagine what it would be like if there wasn't love? Can you picture what life would become? Without love, there'd be no compassion, no comfort, no peace. Without love, there'd be no caring, no giving, no kindness. Without love, we would be consumed by selfishness and filled with arrogance. Without love, grace would have never been offered. Mercy would have been unimaginable. When you add love to the equation, everything changes. Love is patient. Love is kind. Not envious or prideful. Love puts others before ourselves. Chooses peace over anger. Love protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Love changes everything.
Please join me in the call to worship. Let our hearts rejoice in the God of hope and faithfulness. Our strength is in the maker of heaven and earth. Our foundation is the cornerstone that never fails. The rock of ages is a foundation like no other. Hope rises as the tools of war are broken and the weak are given strength. Hope lives when the hungry are fed and the poor are lifted up. God comes bringing judgment to the ends of the earth, calling us to hope and faithfulness. Come, out of ages, come quickly now. Our opening hymn, O God of our help in ages past, is number 25 in our hymn book.
our gathering song, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. You may be seated.
1, verses 14 through 20. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Benina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Alphonse, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant, servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went her way and ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Second Hebrews, second so scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 25. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. For the word of God in Scripture for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. And now the children may come forward.
How are we doing today? Good. Now, like I said last week, 61 years old, 350 pounds, I'm probably not going to sit down. Okay? Although, there are some, some folks out here in the congregation today that spent 20 years carrying me and holding me up. Okay? So I'm sure they can do it again. Last week, I talked a little bit about sharing and how important sharing is, okay? Today, I wanted to real quick talk about helping. What's going to happen in a couple weeks? What's going to happen in a couple weeks? Thanksgiving, right? You think that moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas are going to need a lot of help? Yeah. yeah. And then what happens just a couple weeks after that? Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Exactly. Christmas. Now, do you think that grandma and grandpa and mommy and daddy and uncle are going to need help with Christmas? Yeah. Have any of them said, what do you want for Christmas? Yeah, yeah. And you gave them a list, didn't you? You told them. Okay. That's helping. And when grandma and grandpa... Mom and dad need some help at home with the tree, with the decorations. You can help. Do any of you get to hang? Good. Awesome. You can help at home doing all kinds of things. And after Thanksgiving and after Christmas, you can do things like put dishes away, put your toys away, pull your, put the Christmas tree away. Those don't sound exciting, though, does it? As persons are thank you. But remember, we can always, always help. Okay? Just remember that. Awesome. Good job. Let's say a little prayer. Lord, please be with these young people. Be with all the young people associated with our congregation, our country, and our world. For in the future, we will rely on them for help, to hold us up to get us through. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead. Sharing some prayer concerns today. Um, of course, we want to remember Lloyd, uh, Randy Martin, who we've been praying for for several months, uh, Kathy's husband, uh, brother-in-law to Tom Wire and, and the, the extended Wire family uh, passed away. So we want to remember that family in our prayers, as well as Deb Motzinger, who continues to recover from surgery, and Randy Seeger's mother. I didn't get an update uh, where she is, how she's doing, but Jim just mentioned that we wanted to continue to uplift Randy's mother in prayer, as well as, as others that we know in our heart. Philippians 4, verse 6, pray about everything. Let's go to God in prayer.
Holy God, we come to you in prayer, lifting to you our joys and concerns, our hopes and dreams. Guide us, be open, open our voices, open our eyes, that we may see and hear the direction you call us to travel. Bless this church, our pastor, our members, and our mission, that we may grow and flourish in your love and grace for the purpose to which you call us. Wrap your loving arms around those in power from the oft-forgotten local officials to our president and other world leaders. Let your presence guide their actions and decisions. Lord, be with all members of our armed forces that they may safely serve our country, then return home to families wanting to be whole again. Hear our prayers for those who have been presented to you. Loy, Randy, Deb, Randy's mother, lives who need your touch. And be with those unnamed who are in pain, those who are ill, those who grieve. May we also touch their lives through our prayers, our deeds and our actions, as you showed us through your example. We ask again, Heavenly Father, hear our prayers, those spoken and those hidden in our hearts. Guide us, bless us, and hold us. For we are your people, and you are our Lord. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, we, excuse me, just a second. And this is, and I apologize, as I worked on the sermon, I had next week's sermon. Okay. Prayer yearning. I apologize. Gracious God, hear the anguish of our hearts. Comfort us when our souls feel barren, shriveled, and lifeless. Strengthen us when we feel lost and alone. Heal us when we hurt and misuse ourselves to others. Guide us to your strong arms of love, that we may receive your gracious mercy and rest in your powerful love. In hope and gratitude, we pray. Amen. Hold on to hope, for God is faithful and true. The promise of love is ours, through the grace of Christ Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
again, I apologize. I was going to mention earlier that, and Gina caught it, thank goodness for Gina. Um, part of the bulletin that I worked from was for next week. So I hope I don't steal any of Jim's thunder. Anyway, today's scripture, the destruction of the temple and signs of the end of times. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and Rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will arise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. May the Lord look in favor with the reading of the word. Not one stone. In 1 Samuel, we hear the story of Vivian Red, um, where Hannah is barren. She receives favor from her husband, but she can't have a baby. For years, she goes to the temple. For years, she offers her up, herself up to the Lord. And finally, the Lord finds favor in her, and Hannah is with child, and bears Samuel. And through Samuel, we get Saul, King David, and the other leaders and prophets that we find in the Bible. Through Hannah, we find lessons about purity, trust, self-sacrifice, faith, obedience, and thankfulness. Last week we talked a little bit about giving and different ways that we can give. For years and years and years, Hannah gave to the Lord. And through her perseverance, the Lord rewarded her. Rewarded her with a son that would be leaders throughout the Old Testament. Hebrews, I've got up here performance versus the assurance of a new way. Chronologically, Hebrews comes after the passage I read. In Hebrews, we hear and learn about the Pharisees, how they preach and have prayers all day. If you remember last week, it was the lesson about the widow with the two coins. And in Hebrews, we learn about the Pharisees and their pomp and circumstances and putting on a performance versus the real thing. And what is the real thing? Love. Charity treating each other with respect. Those are the messages that we learn from Jesus. There's a famous author, and I'm sure many of you have heard of Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar, uh, one of my favorite quotes, messages, passages of his 
was, and of course, we talk about it in education all the time. Very seldom in life do we come up with new, brilliant ideas. There are some folks who are out of this world. But many times we are reinventing, we're tweaking, we're changing what's already been done. Why reinvent the wheel? And in one of his uh, publications, Zig Ziglar uses this terminology, and I'll paraphrase, but he says, in essence, and of course he writes it toward the business vocation, but I, I used to use it more toward my personal life. The more you help people, the better you become. Putting others in front of you help you become a better person in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. Now again, when I first read this, it was business oriented. And I thought, you know what, isn't that like real life? Shouldn't we put others in front of us? The more we help others, it's better for our hearts and souls. And that's one thing that the Pharisees in Hebrews were missing. Because it was all about ritual. It was all about doing the same thing over and over and over again. They would make the sacrifices in the temple. The same sacrifices they'd made the week before. The week before. The year before. But here's this little old lady, this widow woman, who puts two coins in the collection plate. She makes a true sacrifice. And it's through Jesus and the disciples that we begin to learn a new way of living our lives, a new way to treat each other, a new way to worship. This Thursday, Jim's going to be at Tim Hortons. Is that not a new way to worship? We have services out in the shelter. Is that not a new way to worship? People look down at Christians originally because they met in open fields. They met in meadows. They met under tents. Because they weren't in the temple. Now I've shared with you a thousand times. This church that I was lucky enough to come back to. When I sit back there, and I've told you a hundred times. When I'm sitting back there and I close my eyes. I'm not falling asleep. I feel a presence. I feel an ease come over me because this is a house of God. I'm sure there are some churches, houses of God you could go to and maybe not feel that way. But personally, I feel that way here. And I hope that all of you, when you come in on a Sunday morning, when you come in on a Wednesday night, you also can feel that presence. And in Mark, Jesus and the disciples are leaving the temple. One of the disciples, and it doesn't say who, says, look at this marvelous building. And Jesus touches on the point that I just mentioned. Four walls and a roof doesn't necessarily make a place holy. Four walls and a roof doesn't necessarily make a place a house of God. Think of the things that went on in the temple, outside the temple, that Jesus disagreed with. Think about the different teachings that went on during his lifetime that he didn't agree with. That he tried to teach us a new way. He told the disciples, basically, don't get hooked on this building. Because someday the walls will tumble down. And it will be no more. And around A.D. 70, there was a war. There was a battle. And the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed numerous times through history. Right now in Jerusalem, there's one section of the temple that remains. 
is called the Wailing Wall. And that's what some of these pictures are, the background for, for my slides. There's one wall of the temple that's left. Jesus said, do not get caught up in the Falderall. Do not get caught up in the Pharisees and their rituals and their long prayers and their long worship. I'm checking right now. Okay, I'll try to cut her off. Uh, real quick story. And I don't know if Mark remembers this. We were coaching eighth grade football. And it was a great practice. It was offensive day. And it was pretty close to time change. It was getting dark. And he comes over and says, Coach, are we going to stop? I said, why? He said, some of the parents are over there in their cars and they got their headlights on. I wasn't always really smart enough to stop when I needed to. Okay? I do get long-winded sometimes. And I apologize for that. But, Jesus said, when those walls fall down, it's not the end of the earth. It's not Independence Day, the movie. It's not some of those other kind of things we see in multimedia. When those walls tumble down, it will mark a new beginning. He said, you're going to go through trouble. You're going to go through strife. You're going to go through hard times. How many of our original disciples lived to old age? One. That's it. The others ended their lives relatively young through the hands of others because of their belief. But as Jesus said, we're going to go through struggles. We're going to go through hard times. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a way that you will find. In the 21st century, and as I shared shared with you several times, you know, I try to research um, our scripture. I try to research and look at, and, I, and I've shared with you different times on the United Church of Christ website. There's there's uh, mission left, or there's lessons, there's mission work, there's many different things. One of them is called Sermon Seeds, where uh, different preachers have chimed in, different ministers, lay people have chimed in, said their commentary on different verses. Um, to help explain what those verses might mean. How many of you as young kids went through confirmation, catechism, whatever the case may be, and you had to read verses and you were like, what's that mean? How many of you ever once in a while sit in the pews today and either the worship leader, Vivian, the Greek God today, okay, or Pastor Jim reads a verse and you're like, what does that mean? What does that mean to me? I still do that. And every once in a while during the week, I'll pull the bulletin up in my Roadrunner email and go to Sermon Seeds. Go to the website. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean to me? For us, do we represent the new way. Do we in the 21st century with this thing and all the garbage associated with it, there are some good things and we've talked about that before. Are we a part of the new way? Are we willing to go out of our comfort zone? You know, in a sense, we're getting out of our comfort zone having me up here. I'm not a trained minister. You know, I'm a, I'm a wannabe teacher, wannabe coach. Thought I was okay doing construction, but I don't know about that either, you know. But I also feel that when we're called to do something, when someone needs help, when someone needs assistance, let's go out of our comfort zone. 
You guys may not know this. I know that some of those uh, folks sitting back there do know it. Standing in front of adults is one of the hardest things in the world to do. We have educators in our congregation. We have educators, uh, guests with us. We have uh, a young lady who served probably 9 million students in the cafeteria in her lifetime. Probably had no trouble talking to kids. But standing up in front of a group of adults, it's not always easy for, for educators or for anyone. Sometimes we have to step outside of our comfort zone. Sometimes we have to do things a new way. Going to Tim Hortons, going to the shelter, going to the fellowship hall in the basement. 2,000 years ago, we may have been tortured or stoned for those practices because we weren't following ritual. We weren't following what had always been done. We weren't following what is considered right. Through the teachings of Jesus Christ, we learn that a belief in Him, a belief in a higher power, a belief in that Holy Spirit is what it takes. That we don't have to have Pharisees and priests in the temple to have a relationship with the Lord. It is a personal relationship with our Creator, with our Savior. And that's why I believe. Our closing hymn is, I am yours, O Lord, number 455. We doing okay, Gina?
bless you and keep you from this day forward for the rest of our lives. Amen.